language. The Oxford English Dictionary aims to be a comprehensive guide to the English language, charting its long history, how it has grown, and how it continues to be transformed as it is used everywhere in the world where English is spoken. Locally, the OED is well known for including new words from Philippine English into its lexicon as recently as 2015 and 2018. With that, the quirks and curiosities of our English demonstrate the interplay between language and culture. You go to the comfort room and use your TK kit so you will look bonga. You hope that the presidential bill you're voting for will not turn out to be a tap. If you're hungry for a snack, why not eat an ensaymada or pansal? Thirsty for a day? Try buko juice. Feeling warm? We have halo halo and dirty ice cream for that. Our OFWs around the world bring over balik bayan boxes filled with goods and over pasalubong they save up for their families. Sometimes we even send them off with a despedida before they leave the country. You go on gimmicks with your barcada and eat polluted while consuming far too much alcohol than you mainly acceptable. You feel kilig when the two romantic leads in your favorite telesende finally admit their feelings for each other. Clearly, language speaks so much about what we feel and think, serving as a lens to our cognitions and worldviews. It's a complex system that covers everything from the sounds we make and the signs we write to the meanings we infer and the implications of our appearances in our personal and social worlds. As the editors of the OED argue, the legitimization of Philippine English as an equally valid variant of English which reflects Philippine linguistic patterns, society, and culture, recognizes the diversity of a language that continues to evolve because of the needs of the people who use it. So, let's say mabuhay to the psychology of perceiving and using language. Language is a complex phenomenon that we analyze and experience at different levels. What is language? It's so complex that we don't even have a unanimous definition because language sounds and looks like a lot of things. The words you say, read, write, and listen to are language. Cave paintings, Egyptian hieroglyphics, Roman inscriptions, the Rosetta Stone, the Laguna Copper Plate inscription, language, Braille, hand signing, semaphore, Morse code, warning signs, desktop icons, memes, still language. We consider a lot of things as language because, in the broadest sense, it is a system of communication that follows rules to combine sounds or symbols into units which gain meaning through social usage. So. The basic units of language are sounds that we make, like our typical puffs of air or the use of clicking sounds in some African languages. It could also be symbols in other sensory modalities, such as gestures in sign language, surface indentations in Braille, and written documents or visual objects like traffic signs and internet memes. What makes these sounds and symbols special is that we can combine these smaller, more basic components to form larger units, which we call the hierarchical nature of language. At the same time, languages are rule-based in nature, so not all combinations are allowed. We make rule-bound combinations so that we can use the relatively limited number of basic units we have to create an almost infinite number of meaningful chunks. However, these chunks only gain meaning because its user said so. The actual and implied meanings of words change across time as people use these chunks and units for different purposes. For example, the innocent catfish marked by large whiskers around its mouth had its name taken over by the act of deception done by pretending to be someone else on social media. As the editors at OED note, words can be born when more and more people use a term to refer to a particular thing, and it gets a relatively stable definition by consensus. So, languages change and evolve to serve our purposes. Because language is complex, we study it across multiple levels with different fields looking from different lenses. Psychology, working with linguistics, the study of language structure and function, develops psycholinguistics, which studies the mental processes underlying language comprehension, how we understand sounds and symbols, representation, how it's organized in the mind, production, how we're able to write and talk, and acquisition, how we learn language across the lifespan. Because of this, we can dissect language into four levels. For spoken language, phonetics tries to understand all the speech sounds, called phones, that humans can possibly articulate or produce using the speech organs like the tongue and vocal cords, and what acoustic or physical properties define these sounds. Then, phonology looks at how phones can be arranged into syllables and phonemes, which are the basic sounds that can change the meaning of an utterance. 
For example, the D and R sounds are distinct phonemes in English because dome and rome mean different things even if they differ just by the first sound. Filipino doesn't have this distinction. Dam-dam and ram-dam mean the same things, just that we use R in some contexts to make pronunciation easier. At the next level, we consider the structure of language as determined by grammar, or the set of rules that we follow when producing and interpreting language. Morphology looks at the morpheme, the basic unit of meaning in language, and how they're combined to form words. For example, understandable has two morphemes, understand and the suffix able. Under and stand, the words in English, are not morphemes here, because the whole understand is the root word, which means that you can perceive the meaning of something. Understandable doesn't mean you can stand under something. Once you have words, syntax then tells us how we put them together into grammatically correct phrases and sentences. This includes rules such as subject-verb agreement, parts of speech, conjugation, and adjective order. However, analyzing language for meaning, we learn that grammatically correct phrases and sentences are not automatically meaningful or situationally appropriate. For example, linguist Noam Chomsky offered the sentence colorless green ideas sleep curiously as an example of an utterance that has all the proper parts of a complete sentence but is meaningless when taken together. Thus, semantics determines how we attribute meaning to language in the way that we use and interpret it. Still, while semantics can give us the objective or common meaning of a word, Pragmatics tells us that what we say can have connotations or alternative meanings other than those given by a dictionary. That's because meanings and interpretations also depend on what attitudes and beliefs we bring into the language situation, the context where we say things, and even how we say things, using paralanguage and nonverbal cues. I'm happy for you is a good message to hear when a friend gets accepted to their dean university, but just plain rude when offered to a person grieving the death of a significant other. I'll watch over you is romantic when written using cursive script, but a red flag when rendered in chiller or rough typewriter font. And listening is sincere when the person maintains eye contact and a half-hearted gesture when uttered while facing away from you. And in the time of social media, OK means different things when written as K, K smiley face, OK all caps, OK exclamation, OK lowercase, or OK properly spelled out with a period. Finally. We said that language is ultimately in the service of communication, so it is used in different contexts. Language can be used in conversations where people exchange information, such as representatives or factual data or informed opinions, permissives or promises, directives or commands, declarations or situation-specific utterances like speeches, reprimands, rituals, or orations, Expressives, or statements of your psychological states or attitudes, or verdictives like objective evaluations and assessments. Meanwhile, narratives are longer texts that tell us about a coherent progression of events and their relationships between its different aspects, like characters and places. Simply, these are your regular stories, ranging from See What Happened to Me Today to short stories, from novellas to book series, and from film trilogies to epics passed across generations through oral tradition. Lastly, we have discourses, which refer to the shared and implied meaning circulated across multiple texts and sources, which could connect individual experiences with sociocultural circumstances. So, if you've ever asked why language is so difficult to define and study, it's because we're looking at so many things that give our utterances structure and meaning at the same time. We do a lot of things just to figure out what another person is saying. Hopefully, you're getting the message that language is messy and things don't have straightforward meanings. We call this the lack of invariance in language. Speech sounds differ in how easily we can perceive them, and the manner in which we say them can change their meaning. For example, ang galing mo naman means something else entirely from ang galing mo naman, despite the fact that these speech sounds are the same, with only a change in tone. One reason for the lack of invariance is co-articulation. How we pronounce sounds depends on the context of where we say it. Try to say the word level, then hold on to the L sound at the beginning and the end of the word. The initial L sounds brighter, while the final L is called a dark L, because if you keep on saying that sound, you'll notice that it's muffled at the back of your mouth. These two are the same L, but they sound different because of the context. 
The first L is produced, as usual, near the front of the mouth, while the final L is pulled backward because of the preceding E that it is co-articulated with. It. Meanwhile, because of individual variability, we end up pronouncing the same sounds in our own ways as a consequence of individual differences, such as talking speed, changes in casual conversation, accent, or speech defects. To speed up how we say things when conversing with others, we can drop syllables or co-articulate sounds that we don't do in careful speech. We don't say aalis na ako, a wasteful six syllables, when lis na ako is half the length but equally understandable. Fifth becomes fifth and priests becomes peace because it's hard to pronounce all those consonants at the end of the words. So how do we resolve ambiguous speech sounds? First, we rely on the information provided by the speech stimulus. Categorical perception says that speech sounds, like chorus of the rainbow, exist on a continuum arranged based on voice onset time, or when the vocal cords start vibrating so the speech sound becomes audible, instead of wavelengths like in color. For example, the sounds T and D follow the same pattern of sound production based on which mouth parts you use, only that D involves vocal cord vibration and T doesn't. In the International Phonetic Alphabet, a system which aims to catalog all speech sounds used across all languages, we call T and D as the voiceless and voiced alveolar plosives, respectively. So, if you make the sound ta and da, you'll notice that both do make sounds because of the a sound. However, you make a sound immediately with da, while ta takes a bit more time. This difference in when you start hearing the sound is called the phonetic boundary. Had your vocal cords started vibrating earlier, you would have perceived ta as da because the only thing that differentiates them is how long it takes for a sound to come out. Of course, when we try to understand speech, we don't only listen to the person, we also look at their facial expressions and bodily gestures through the process of audiovisual speech perception. What that means is we use the patterns of mouth movements to read speech based on what we know about the relationship between speech organ shapes and the sounds they produce. That's why some people who are hard of hearing can pick up on what you're saying through lip reading. Also, we use gestures such as pointing and waving to emphasize our points. In some cases, these gestures are redundant, such as when a person says look over there and they point to that direction as well, so we can understand what they're saying despite the speech signal being interrupted. On top of the physical characteristics of speech production, we also rely on our knowledge of how language works to fill in the blanks when speech signals get interrupted. As the word frequency effect demonstrates, we're able to respond faster to words that occur more often in our language because our many experiences of using language allow us to pick up on the fact that some words are used more frequently, and so we guess that people mean to use these over more obscure words. At the same time, because of speech segmentation, we learn to put pauses and spaces between words even if we speak in continuous utterances. We're able to do this through the statistical learning of transitional probabilities. Like in the word frequency effect, we figure out that some morphemic or syllable sequences are more likely than others in a language. To make these phenomena clear, let's consider the phonemic restoration effect, a phenomenon that shows how we can complete speech signals even when they get distorted or interrupted. When you make phone or online calls, the connection would sometimes drop in quality so you'd end up receiving garbled or fragmented speech. In other cases, because of individual variability, we can have conversations with people who don't have very clear articulation or an accent completely foreign from our own. Either way, say you heard the confusing speech fragment a a e a a o. What does that mean? For one thing, vowels are easier to voice, so it's usually the consonants that get dropped. You could then safely guess that you're trying to put consonants back. Next, look at the context. You know that you were talking in Filipino, and one rule in this language is that words typically follow consonant-vowel clusters. You don't have that many words that have many consonants or vowels coming after each other in close succession, like the English stents or queuing. Speech segmentation, statistical learning, and transitional probabilities would then say that it isn't likely for you to have just one long word, while two to three words are more like it, given Filipino syllabic rules. Still, just looking at Filipino words which have just the a a e a a o vowels in that order, we still have a lot of expressions to choose from. Sasapit ang Pasko and Balari Lambago are possible, but the word frequency effect says that these aren't likely in everyday speech unless Christmas is on the horizon or you're in Filipino class talking about grammar. 
However, you'd still have phrases like malalim na baso and kakapit na sayo, which are likelier. With this, you'd look for the context of your conversation in addition to the physical and psychological characteristics of the speech signal, which have significantly narrowed down your interpretation choices. If you're telling someone that you'd be out for a while, aalis na ako. A friend offering you comfort in a time of need, dalangin at payo. A warning before entering the house of a dog lover, malaki ang aso. Or if you just want to tell them to get ready because you're on your way, malapit na ako. The amazing thing is that all of this language processing, which includes perception, judgment, interpretation, and response making, happens in milliseconds, all made possible by your extensive exposure to and use of language. So, don't be afraid to use your words. You've already expended so much effort to think about things, so it's just fair for you to have your say. We use our knowledge of language and context to understand longer texts and conversations. So far, we've only considered language processing at the level of sounds, words, phrases, and short sentences in the context of spoken language. A related process happens when we try to interpret what written language means through parsing or how we group words into coherent phrases and sentences. This isn't a straightforward task, though. That's because of lexical ambiguity, the fact that words can have more than one meaning. For example, the word set has the longest entry in any English dictionary because it can be used in hundreds of ways. Sunset, a TV set, a filming set, letting something set to cool down or solidify, set fury in mathematics, the list goes on. One thing that helps us is meaning dominance, the relative frequency by which we've encountered the different meanings of a word. Bias dominance, where one meaning is more common, is the case for the word overlook, which is either failing to see or notice something, the common interpretation, or a place where you can view something from above. Uncommon unless you're a writer for a vacation spot. Meanwhile, set, as we noted earlier, follows balanced dominance. A lot of its definitions occur equally frequently in our daily life. So, while biased dominance predisposes us to resolve ambiguity by using the definition we more frequently encounter, balanced dominance isn't much helpful because all definitions are equally likely. So, we take into account the context where the word is used. An early approach to parsing is the garden path model, which follows late closure. As we read along a phrase or sentence, words are added to the end of the text finger processing because we assume that it's still part of the same phrase. We then use heuristics or quick guidelines to processing based on our experiences of using language, like syntactic structure, to determine when the current phrase ends. The problem is that these heuristics aren't foolproof and lead us to parse sentences incorrectly thus ending up with meaningless and confusing interpretations. We call this temporal ambiguity. Once we parse a sentence incorrectly, we'd find out that we messed up too late and so we have to start over again to reorganize our interpretation. This is demonstrated in garden path sentences like the classic example on screen. The first issue you face is that complex follows balanced dominance. It can either be the noun, which means a compound that contains multiple households, or the adjective, meaning having a lot of parts. Next, you misuse the heuristic that an English sentence begins with a subject, which typically contains an article, a noun, and any adjectives that precede it. But the example uses complex as a noun and not as an adjective. Then, temporal ambiguity informs you that you messed up when you reach married end. We know that houses, being inanimate and non-human objects, cannot marry others. Okay, we assume that these houses live in an animated or magical realistic world where they do have human-like characteristics. It still doesn't explain why the next word is end, when an English sentence should proceed with the direct or indirect objects of the verb. So, you go back and v parts. The complex, a set of households, houses, or provides residence to, married and single soldiers, and their families. Later researchers then subscribe to the notion that we use not just the syntactic structure of sentences to interpret them, but also additional information such as semantics, story and scene contexts, or sentence complexity to predict the best organization and what can appear next. We call this the constraint-based approach to parsing. One constraint is word meanings. For example, take the sentence stem, the blank released by the guardian was unusual, then put either the word patient or statement. What happens? The patient released has two meanings possible. 
either the patient did the releasing or the patient was the recipient of the release. Meanwhile, the statement released can only mean that the statement was given publicly because statements are typically not capable of releasing anything. So, our knowledge of what the subject can typically do already gives us information about how we should parse and partition the sentence. Similarly, as we discussed in attention, we look around the world and fixate on things only in time for the information they can give us. So, as we are being given information, our visual scanning and fixating process tends to follow how we parse sentences based on the context. For example, in an experiment, participants were shown an apple on a towel, another similar towel, and then a box. The researchers track how participants scanned the scene as they were given the deliberately ambiguous sentence, but the apple assumes that you'd have to take the apple, then, reading along, you think that it should be moved on the towel. But this is wrong, because on the towel is only a description of where the apple is, and not an instruction which is what in the box is for. So, people tend to look at the apple, then to the towel, realize their mistake, and be fixate on the apple, then ending on the box. This ambiguity could be resolved by making on the towel a defining clause. Put the apple that's on the towel, then makes it clear that the towel is just a location, not a direction of what to do. This confusion is decreased though when the researchers read the same sentence to another group of participants who were looking at the same scene, except with an additional apple on a napkin. In this case, on the towel was understood as a descriptor because participants were already waiting for it, given that they wanted to figure out which apple was being talked about in the first place. Finally, another example of a constraint is based on sentence complexity. Sentences have main clauses which tell us what's happening, while embedded clauses can specify details such as agent, location, duration, or manner. Take the two sentences, the senator who spotted the reporter shouted, and the senator who the reporter spotted shouted. In both cases, the senator shouted is the main clause, because the senator is responsible for the main action of shouting. It's the embedded clause that can throw people off. In the first sentence, the embedded who spotted the reporter is a subject relative construction. This just clarifies which senator is shouting, but the clause just adds that the senator also did some spotting. The interpretation is straightforward because it's one agent doing two things. But the second sentence follows an object relative construction. Two different agents are doing two things with the senator shouting and the reporter spotting. It takes a longer time and more cognitive resources to parse because you have to match who with what he did. So far, we've been looking at how we understand language when you have all the information you need just that the quirks of speech sounds, word meanings, and sentence structures sometimes throw us off the right path. But in longer stories, conversations, and discourses, not everything you need is explicitly indicated. Sometimes, you need to do some guesswork to fill in the blanks. We call these inferences, or how we use our knowledge of how the world works, to go beyond what information is given to us. For example, in the sentence, Sam was relieved that Alex arrived early for their meeting with the local union, so she introduced him to them before they started. Notice that we have a lot of pronouns filling in for Sam, Alex, and the union, but you know through anaphoric inference how to match which person with which pronoun. Most impressive is that third-person plural pronouns appeared three times, but you know that their, them, they refer separately to Sam and Alex, the union, and all of them together in each instance. Meanwhile, even if it's not mentioned in the sentence, Filipinos develop many recipes that have ingredients which can increase the shelf life of food, we use instrument inference, or experience about what objects are used to complete an action, to decide that ingredients refer to foodstuffs like salt, sugar, and vinegar, given your knowledge of Philippine cuisine. Finally, causal inference allows you to assume that things stated earlier in a narrative or conversation give rise to events that occur much later. This is evident in the principle named after Russian playwright Anton Chekhov, called Chekhov's Gun, a version of which says that if there's a gun shown in the play, it must be used in the play. So, in the sentences, the farmer fired a blank from his gun, the birds flew away, you assume that the birds reacted to the sound of the gunshot. Otherwise, we'd be confused if the two statements did not have any relationship with each other. What makes these inferences possible is that we develop situation models, or simulations of the perceptions and actions narrated in the story as we parse through a narrative. Going back to the farmer, you could imagine him carrying a gun and blank cartridges, aiming at the flock of birds and pulling the trigger. You could also imagine the birds with their wings down while consuming the farmer's well-valued crops, 
from spreading their wings to take flight upon hearing the gunshot. All of these scenes and movements were not described at all in the sentences, but similar experiences, as in working in the farm or watching an agriculture-themed film, give you enough knowledge to imagine what was implied but never stated. Fortunately, we don't walk the world alone. Instead, to understand what's happening around us, we can get more information by engaging in conversations with other people. It may not be obvious, but we actually operate under a few implicit rules regarding how we ask questions, provide answers, and exchange ideas across time. Through the theory of mind, we try to understand where people are coming from, what intentions or beliefs are bringing in, and then we adjust our reactions depending on what outcomes we also want to achieve. Because of this, we start our conversations by trying to achieve common ground, or understanding what knowledge we share with our conversation partner. From this, we follow the given new contact. We form sentences that reiterate given information so we are sure that we are on the same page and provide new details so that we both leave the conversation more enlightened than we began. We establish common ground even in the way we give information. Through syntactic coordination, we mirror the grammatical structure of our partner sentences so it will be easy for them to see parallels between what we already know and what we are giving them. We do the same thing through entertainment, where we use appropriate words and nonverbal cues to reflect our partner's manner of speaking and gesturing. For example, I'm able to use technical terms from psychology and related fields to talk to you about language and conversations because I believe that you'd be able to make sense of them as a psychology major studying psycholinguistics. However, in scientific communication, if my goal was to share findings from journal articles to the general public, I'm likely to skip the statistics and the jargon and instead use language that is more accessible and provide insights that's more directly related to the public's everyday life. Above all, we try to follow the cooperative principle when holding conversations because our goal after all is to make contributions that enhance our knowledge and strengthen our relationships. Based on this principle, we follow the maxims of quality where we say only what we know is true, withhold what we think is false, and hesitate to share when we're not sure or don't have enough evidence to support our claims, quantity, to share only as much as needed and not provide too much information, relation or relevance, to talk only about the things that are directly useful to what we want to achieve in the current situation, and manner, to be clear, concise, and unambiguous when applying. Of course, as influenced by culture, like the case of Filipinos, we don't always follow the maxims to the letter, because sometimes, we think that the context or our shared knowledge can already provide some or much of the information we don't directly give. If you ask a close friend about your romantic partner, saying, Maganda, guapo ba siya? And they reply, Magalang, mabait, the evasive answer implies a no, but done in a manner trying to be inoffensive. The perpetual, Saan niyo gusto kumain? where the response, Ikaw bahala, is an affirmation that we value our relationship so much that we can downplay our own opinions about non trivial things like food, and instead let our friends decide for us at the risk of starving because no one wants to make a choice. Essentially, Conversations show that cognition is ultimately a social affair. We perceive, think, talk, and decide not only for ourselves but also in the context and for the benefit of others we value. Language is so important to us as social beings that it makes sense for it to have many complex levels of analysis, from sounds to how we combine them, from words to how we make sentences, and from basic utterances to the direct and implied meanings we derive in narratives and conversations. Ultimately, language serves the purpose of making our internal mental states observable and knowable by others. Without language, we won't be able to share what's inside our heads, and we might not be able to see the complexity of human societies we see at present, made possible by the communicative and cooperative benefits of language. Now that we can communicate and understand others, it becomes clear that cognition is in the service of action, whether to secure our own goals or to work with others to achieve common ends. Indeed, our problem-solving and decision-making abilities, as we'll be exploring in the next two episodes, rely on our ability to think and talk when confer with others about the information we have. See you then!